All right. That's the the sound of the what did they call that? Clapboard. The clapboard? Yeah. That's a clapboard. Yeah, I think this is clapboard. So this is the synced. This is this is our interview series, which we call Touching Bases, where we touch bases with you guys, both musically and personally. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah. Nice to have you guys in Budapest. Yeah. Welcome <laughs> again. We we had like a little bit of time in the car earlier. Yeah. Um oh, nice. we were uh so it's like, okay, let me try and find a photo. Um, we had really cool things about Toldy. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's one of the better, the better spaces in the city. Um, it's like one of the only kind of 300 capacity, kind of medium, small sized clubs. Mm. And... Um, and yeah, we've has a, had a residency there for a while. Um, I think it's it was a really nice like starting point for us, mm. and we'll be kind of moving out of there a bit in the in the next year. But it's a really lovely space. It's, this is the the kind of stage design, and then we were we were making all the the bits, um, the rectangles and the squares and the out of cardboard, and then. One of our one of our visuals guys, uh, Rolia, is going to uh, like do like visual mapping on it. So it's like just going to be the shapes somehow. I'm not I'm not super super well versed in the technical side of it, but uh, it's going to look good. It's just like limiting the visuals to the shape and then making like weird stuff happen with it. So yeah, we want to do like some more kind of community community vibe stuff mm. and so we've started doing these little decoration workshops where we kind of make the decoration for the party together with some friends and uh, acquaintances not just friends we, we want to open it up more public um, eventually it's just we need to find like a good space for it because it requ requires quite a bit of space and it gets messy as well and yeah but um but yeah, after, after, um, I'm, so I'm going to take you guys to the hotel now. And then, um, if, um, if, if, if either one of you wants to like walk around one of our, um, one of our team members, Marcy is going to meet us at the hotel so he can give you some basic, um, we saw there's a pinball guidance. Museum. We really want to go to the pinball museum. <laughs> I have never heard of this. Well, uh, we're going. It's really close to the hotel as well. Amazing. I had no idea. Pinball? Yeah. <laughs> About a thousand pinball machines that you can play. What? So it's not a, not just a museum, it's a, like a pinball arcade? Yeah, hands on. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's what that we're doing. Um, what would you recommend? 24 hours in Budapest, what you gotta do? Um, see the castle? See like the main the main castle in the middle of the city that's next to the river. And then you can see like the whole city. It's on a hill. Oh so you can see the whole city. And then maybe like there's three main record shops. Maybe those. Um, yeah, I'd say those if you had to and, and a bath. If you can hit a bath. I forgot yeah. my trunks. <laughs> can you so, rent yeah. some? Can you rent trunks? I'm sure you can. Sick. <laughs> it, I mean, it used to be like fully nude. You just got a like it's a string, and there's a piece of paper, like a square, on it. But it's only one side, so you got to choose so if it's if, if you're covering the front or if you're in the sauna, then you want to cover the back because it's just gonna burn your yeah. butt. Say Choices. This is like the most exciting part. For, it's starting to become one of the most exciting parts for me, just like sitting down and having like a full conversation, like the same I would like to have next to a drink, but, uh, <laughs> but a bit more structured yeah. and yeah. a bit more like, you know, thought out mm -hmm. um, for people to get some, uh, some info about you guys. Um, and so um, 
we were talking uh, earlier that you guys met um, in, uh, in kind of uni age at Corsica Studios through friends. Mm -hmm. um, I want to kind of go back to, to, the, to the beginning of, um, of FYI Chris and also of Chris and Chris mm -hmm. as individuals. Yeah. Because uh, I read somewhere, maybe on a rhythm section, a uh, little uh, press, uh, press uh, text that uh, you guys bonded over similar influences from your childhood. Um, so this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, maybe let's go like one at a time, mm -hmm. being a duo. Where did music come into your life initially? How did it start? Oh, you know, it's spotlights on you. Spotlights on you. Come on, man. Um, I think, I don't know, I just used to go and see a lot of gigs when I was younger. Uh, I was mainly into like ska, weird punk bands, mm. stuff I definitely wouldn't be able to listen to now. Mm. Uh, and then just gone for a range of stuff over the years, post-punk, yeah. rap. Yeah. And did it come from the family? Kind of right at the end, to be honest. Did it come from the family? Uh, did it come from the environment mom, as well? My mum's mum was a piano teacher, so there's always pianos in her house. Mm. But, um, no, not really for listening. My parents didn't really listen to music. <laughs> <laughs> just skip the generation. Yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's actually pretty similar though, because yeah. my mum, she listened to like uh, Shania Twain, Alanis Morissette, Cooler Shaker, Jamiroquai, and there's one more, brand new heavies, and that's basically the five albums she had on repeat. But, Those were the classics. But every, and she'll, she'll hate me for saying that, but she kind of knows it's true. <laughs> but um, my, my nan and my granddad are really into music, like pianist, and he runs the Macclesfield Jazz Club for about three people. And they just meet every two weeks and make a cassette and tell each other about an artist or something. Hmm. So there was always music around. Nice. Um, but yeah. And sort of earlier years, like in your childhood, uh, did you guys like play any instruments? I mean, pianos or? Um, oh, I definitely picked up the guitar. guitar. Mm. Played guitar in a bunch of bands in school. Mm. Made a loud noise, not much else. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. trying wherever yeah. you could. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Watson? Same, but um, ignoring, ig ignoring my nan's attempts to teach me piano because I thought it was lame. Yeah, I um, think a lot of us had that. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, I didn't want to be like David Gray or something. Mm. I'd much rather be like a Hendrix than a David Gray. Mm. Oh, at least that's what I was thinking at 12, you know. Um, but yeah. And then was it just records for you, or was it also any instrument in particular? I got my first X when I was 15, because my, my sister's trampoline flew away in a storm, but it was insured by Argos. <laughs> so they gave us these vouchers for like... And my mum was like, well, you bounce on the trampoline as much as she does, so like, you, could, you can have half of this. And there was some Ministry of Sound turntables in there. <laughs> They're like pff, the shittiest things ever. What um, was the trampoline? We it used blew away. It was a massive like storm. Um, uh, I can't re I can't remember what the hurricane was called. It's but insured for a storm. Well, like they it gave you a new one. It literally blew. I don't know why it was insured or whatever. It must have been one of those things at the till you can like. Oh, do you want to add yeah. insurance to this for 15 yeah. quid? extreme weather cover. <laughs> we live next to train hey, tracks. Yeah. It flew, it almost landed straight onto the train. It could have caused some horrible disaster. <laughs> but um, instead, I got some really shit belt drive decks and used to go with a mate up to Manchester on the train with pocket money and like get too scared to go into Eastern Bloc. So we'd just go into HMV and buy like scratch records and breaks and like I'd go home and after school and just like try and scratch mm. until my mum told me to shut the fuck up <laughs> um, and then yeah started buying more housey bits and fidget house and stuff you know like blog house and all that mm. 
like hype, what was it? Hype machine. The, mm. the aggregator yeah, 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 used to yeah. be on that all the time. All the edits and yeah. uh, quirky, quirky little music, exactly. blog music. I was on Bebo, that. all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big DJ Sega fan mm. and Switch. Mm. Switch was one of my like big heroes, definitely. Dave Taylor. And um, so you were just kind of digging, practicing on your own time and then... Uh, how did, um, were you already doing some DJing before you guys met or how, uh, how was that yeah, for you? Yeah, yeah. yeah They're yeah. very different kind of gigs. I used to have a, a thing and there's a little town called Guildford outside of London. It has the music school, right? Yeah, exactly. That's, that where, ACM. Um, that's where Liam meant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there was, a, there was a little club there called the Boiler Room. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they, I convinced them to let us take our MIDI controllers there. Uh, and it was like, like indie clash i don't know if that means anything to you <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like, um that kind of kissy cello kissy cello exactly <laughs> uh, yes. i, I try to think I, we were just basically throwing like beck instrumentals and dizzy rascal acapellas over each other like a horrible clash of indie and electronic like craft work was like a peak. bang face yeah yeah like, yeah um and we convinced them to let us go there. I think it was like a Wednesday night, like a midweek night. We could go and they let mm. us play music there all night. Other nights we'd go there and see bands. It was a really cool little venue. Um, Boys Club. Called The Boiler Room. The Boiler Room? Yeah. The original little, Boiler Room. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'd never heard of the other one before I moved there. And then from there moved to uni, didn't mix for ages. Mm. Uh, and then found a, a bunch of like-minded people at uni uh, who I was on courses with shared accommodation with and they were all some of them had decks it was the first time we got to play around with decks and things like that nice. uh, and just slowly got more and more into dance music definitely drum and bass huge influence moving to london uh i got to, we moved there around the same time as dubstep is kind of just getting really big as well so mm -hmm. uh yeah really exciting going to all these clubs yeah hearing this music big sound system something that didn't exist in our hometowns really yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah. yeah we we tried to like make do because mac and congleton when i went to high school like so tiny but there's so many like i don't know there's that influence from the northern soul and hacienda kind of scenes that like there's all this like culture of like let's just someone's got a sound system take it to a pub and let's play like <laughs> minimal techno uh to all our mates mm. but that was kind of it. I, they were the ones who were like, I'll get you into Sankey's, got fake IDs and like going up with all the minimal techno heads watching like Clive Henry, DC 10 and mm. Robert Hood and stuff. But then all the other mates I'd hung out with would be junglists and I'd be in the middle and they'd kind of take the piss out of me for liking the other kind yeah. of thing. And I never understood that. It's like, it was all good. Yeah. But, um, Moving down to London was, like you said, because, you know, dubstep was kicking off and, like, mm -hmm. all my favourite artists at that time were there. So, like, in, if I was going to do study music anywhere, it, it'd be there just to go to the gigs and be inspired, I guess. Yeah. And then, uh, and then how did you guys, uh, was it sort of through this group of friends that you guys ended up uh, meeting? Loosely. We both went the... to South Bank Uni in mm -hmm. Elephant Castle. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a couple of years ahead of Watson, but for a mutual friend who'd gone to the ACM in Guildford, he ended up going to South Bank to do music uh, and was on the same course with these guys and kind of through through friends, uh, Shout moved, out, in with, uh, moved in with Watson's classmates and through that started meeting each other more often, mostly through Corsica Studio student nights. And Tom's nights as well, really, as well. Yeah, Tom nights are like church, wavy tones are like two nights we were going to quite a lot. Mm. Really fun, really kind of um, sparked a love for uh, dance music. Yeah, good uh, bookings as well. Yeah, really good bookings. There's like that crossover where the dubstep drum bass influence is getting thrown into the kind of house techno London thing and new really exciting music was coming out all yeah. the time it was, felt really like every weekend there was a new sound almost yeah um, Corsica was, was one of those one of those really exciting yeah it was places. a real like, melting pot of all, all yeah. sorts you'd have like the student nights on the thursdays which is like a 
um, you know, like bass heavy sound, and then at the weekend you'd venture have nights like Teeth, which was just an epitome of the deep Berlin house kind of techno sound. Hmm. So I was working there for three years. I was really fortunate. I felt quite like. Nice. What did you work there? I started off picking up bottles there, getting to listen to the music, standing in the back of the room, listening to all, all sorts. Going, I hadn't really been into house or techno. I'd maybe been like really in like a drum bass dubstep bubble until then. And then being around these club nights every weekend, I slowly like got really, really into it. I remember Presumer being a particular DJ there where it's mm. like, Everything clicked all of a sudden, and I was just obsessed with house music. I just wanted to listen to as many house DJ sets as I could, list all the different sounds. Mm. Living with Ned, who was who Watson was on a course with, also Medler, big up Medler. Mm. Um, he was really into the disco sound, and that was kind of all just like, I don't know, two or three years of listening back to back here, yeah, drum, bass, dubstep, house, techno, disco, uh, become really influential and in just making from making music when I was younger. I'd given up on making music on computers for years and then got a little MIDI controller and eventually an MPC and it just became an obsession. Yeah. And how did, how did, it, how did you guys come to work together in the end? I remember it was just a, a barbecue that you had at your house or something. Yeah, you were like, a few barbecues. Yeah, but then you were like, oh, I've got this MPC 2000. I was like, what? I've never like used one ever. And obviously we like a lot of the same similar hip hop, which is like, you know, supremely based on it. So I've always been interested in that. And Chris was just like, come round. Like, like, we should like, learn how to use it together. I didn't have a clue how to use it. felt like just getting this big calculator. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't know what I was doing with it. Just putting little beats in slowly. Uh, you know, um, Ned it was actually, again, a big influence. He'd had the MPC 2000. I loved just going in his room, playing with it. He had a Juno at the time, and I think a 909, just these three bits of kit, and we would just spend hours. Eventually, instead of using his MPC 2000, it was like, okay, I need to get my own MPC 2000. Um, and I probably only got into records like a year or so before, and I'd been like quite obsessively buying records. So there's always mm. records I wanted to sample and take bits of. So when you eventually get the machine, it's like, right, let's learn how to use it as quick as possible. Yeah. And then throw all these samples into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, you can hear that on sort of the earlier uh, releases. It's, it's a lot of this like kind of sample driven yeah. house music. And um, how, did, how did this, um, I mean, then I guess I'll, uh, I'll move a little bit into just the releases. So we kind of run through them because so that, that kind of stuff was like 2014, 2015 yeah. when those came out on, uh, on Church. Mm -hmm. The first feel uh, EP, yeah. Yeah, that feels like a long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then from there, um, how, how did how did your like production style develop? Because then it it, it very quickly becomes like really interesting uh, drums with really interesting tones mm -hmm. and um, like a quite a particular kind of like mixing, like the the sound the sounds the the levels of the sounds are sort of. Um, really interestingly panned also a lot of times like um, how is your how do you see your production style like changing since then mm. uh, I reckon the first few records are just accidents mm. in the sense that we've just learned how to use this machine It's a really different writing style to what we'd both done before and I'd never even kind of recorded tunes until we'd recorded those first mm. Uh, once before we've been in bands and things like that, but I don't think there's anything that's like, oh, I feel like this is a finished song that's just happened, you know. Uh, it, um, and then just learning how to use it better and better between two of you. It's a great making music as a duo because there there is a big a diffusion of responsibility in a sense that there's two of you doing it. So I think we're both. Uh, I don't know. But we're also coming from it like from that initial con conversation of like let's learn how to use this fucking thing mm -hmm. like every kind of tune was in, oh we can do this and like mm -hmm. oh maybe maybe let's use it in this way now so I think the progression was that coupled with like bringing it back into the box a bit more yeah manipulating like s s finding thing recording things maybe into Ableton, taking them t 
to the NPC and then putting them back and arranging them. Yeah, they're yeah. going to a computer more and more as we made music. The first records are literally just uh, an, a stereo recording out from an NPC. And then so it's like, oh, we've got these laptops as well. We can record onto a laptop and manipulate it more and more there. Hmm. Um, I don't consider myself that musical. Like I can make stuff that I think sounds nice in my head, but I don't know what I'm doing. So it's kind of doing that more and more and becoming more confident with that. Yeah. Just being around keyboards and things like that. Yeah. Um, I think it gets more melodic because also, we get slightly more confident at playing our own stuff rather than mm. just sampling all the time. Yeah. Also, the uh, paddles. Oh, yeah. You Definitely can... a few little bits of kit. Uh, Mostly guitar pedals that just like so your past your past yeah, coming feel, back yeah, the, the, yeah. That is that particular sound. There's oh. one by I always forget the name of the company Zvex. It's just called a Lo-Fi Junkie. Mm. Uh, really simple um, pedal that just makes stuff sound really rotten and just became like a go-to. And another one is the Moog Delays have a drive on it and it just like really warms up a sound automatically. And also, you can just fucking glob something out, make it gloop, yeah. so mm -hmm. easy. And just becoming, becoming really versed, I guess, in these little bits of kit yeah. that we that kind of rely, that our sound uh, maybe not relies on, but we really want to add to the palette every time. Yeah, it because sounds better once we add you, it. You, you have such, more and more, you guys have such like interesting textures sort of in the, in the background. Do you guys record like environmental sounds at all? Or is that more uh, just manipulated? In the Ableton's box, amazing afterwards. for manipulating samples. Mm. Uh, but also, we re-record stuff out yeah. through like the stage echo and stuff, yeah. just to get layers that we can bring in and out mm -hmm. if, if if we want or whatever. Um, we just like we don't like clean sounding things. I don't think <laughs> because no. of our and maybe <laughs> yeah because of our influences back in the day. Like mm -hmm. all the hip hop, it's not clean. It's mm -hmm. like some of the samples cut at the wrong times, but that's what gives it the flow. Yeah, you get like a fluffy sample. All you know, the it's got all stuff, the yeah. bits on the outside, and they're the best sounding bits, and you want to kind of keep them in, in, in the tune, giving it a, a little bit of a, a texture. We yeah. were looking at, we, I was working for a fella called Andy Blake mm. for a little while, and he sold. Big up Woo. Yeah, big up World Unknown, great parties. Um, he was a, a big influence, showing me loads of records at times, selling me loads of kit. He had all this kit that was really dusty and sat on a kind of a you know in an attic for ages and he, he sold it to me for quite cheap mm. um and it was all it was the broken sound of those machines as well especially this tape delay we had mm. um that you could just record something onto it it would sound horrible on it and then you'd slow the tape right down and all of a sudden you had this amazing texture and it felt great just throwing a bit of reverb on that putting in the background of a tune mm pitching it around on the pads on the MPC. A lot mm. of experimentation. Mm. Um, yeah, like we say, we just throw loads of shit and see which bits yeah. stick. And yeah. it's those bits that you get into, especially when you're working in a duo. It's a lot easier to sit down when you're on your own and be like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write a song. I really want it. But when there's two of you, you don't really have that kind of control and that's what kind of makes it exciting. But you can also be like, is this good? Yeah. And the other person could be like, I'm no, not sure. It's not good. Whereas on your own, you can just do that for hours. Mm -hmm. like, maybe it is good, mm -hmm. actually. No, yeah. but maybe I'm thinking of it wrong. Yeah. It's like, if you're in a duo, you can just be like, this bit's a bit... It doesn't fit, does it? Yeah. And like, mm -hmm. yeah oh, but it yeah, could yeah. sound good on its own, and then you end up just starting that in a new project. Yeah, it's because you like yeah. the sound, it just didn't fit in that project. Mm -hmm. It's kind of... I think you don't get that sort of motivation when you're on your own. Or at least fine when I do make... Uh, you know, I still make music when I'm on my own, but... It's very easy just to get stuck in your head with it and not think you're progressing anywhere. Yeah, and um, uh, how, how do you guys think about uh, your kind of division within the duo? Are, are there is there a certain kind of way that you maybe like one of you starts it off, balances it to the other person, um, or is it really random? Um, Chris a lot of the time does drums and be like, and will be like, well, because you've got all this stuff there. So yeah. that's a good example of what happens is if I try and make music on my own, I get really into making drums and then. Get bored, and you get and really it's fed up with it. Because Watson comes around the next day, and we just have the and drums there nice already. Drums, yeah. Or we'll have a sample. We usually, say you know, bring a record over, and we'll mm. just go mm. through stuff. A lot of YouTube. We love YouTube. 
with probably Talk way too much YouTube ripping in our songs. That is mm. like, there's lots of hidden mm. like meme videos and stuff in our songs that I don't think people at clock. Mm. Um, cause, but yeah, there's love. lots of internet culture the internet. In, in there. <laughs> you guys yeah. love the little vocal chops yeah. and the I think the weird internet's little more sentences. of an influence <laughs> on our music than anything else, just oh. in general. Did you like Lemon Jelly? Back in the day. Uh, I only listened only recently, like a few years ago, did I hear them, not back in the day, but... I swear that's always left a bigger, um, like all those old, like, um, the Orb and stuff, mm. like, mm -hmm. like that 90s kind of wave of putting some philosophical speech or some like tripped mm -hmm. out kind of vocal that just like goes over the top of some sick tune. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that was... Uh, definitely left an impression on me for sure. Because hmm. I'm like, instrumental is great, but like sometimes, like, something out, taken out of context and put over a tune can like make you think about all sorts of shit. Yeah, I think we find it hard <laughs> to make it just completely instrumental tunes. It's almost an achievement when we make something <laughs> and we decide it doesn't need some strange sample over the top of it. it, it, it that's you know, where we've usually gained the inspiration to start the tune from is a uh, YouTube a, video yeah, or something yeah, like yeah. that. So there is that little bit of vocal or mm. that bit of uh, wording that we've been into. The mm. other way around, sometimes we'll have made an instrument and then we'll spend hours listening to YouTube over the top of yeah. a tune to see if we find something that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But yeah, YouTube's great. And um, how, how does the studio work for you guys? Or how has it been over the past couple of years? Where do you make music together? Well, there used to be a studio at mine, mm. um, but now it's a room for a friend. So um, uh, it's just at Chris's now. Although I'm lucky enough to have a spare bedroom in our flat in <coughs> London, and that's just a little studio, quite a, a, a subtle little studio. Mm. It's a couple of synthesizers, an MPC. We've mm. upgraded. I sold the MPC 2000, which is a slight regret. Uh, but we're on the MPC Live now, which is quite futuristic. Mm. It's crazy. It is crazy. So it does a lot of it's, it. Basically, we've been using the 2000 for ages, and there's loads of stuff like, oh, I wish this machine could do this. And then the, the new machine just does all of that stuff. Yeah. So, but you, you miss it a little bit? You uh... Kind of. There, there was a, you know, like a, a madness in the machine. You never, we, I never mastered the 2000 XL at all. It's, so much spinning the wheel and you become, you can be a little bit lazier with it. Sometimes when you've got everything there, you become more precise and you lose a little bit of the mm. uh, well, time. The, the, so it's like trying to remember that when you... The constraints on it, like, you know, the, 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 the features that the live has kind of means that you can do whatever, whereas the MPC 2000 or the old, you know, the older models kind of limit you in a, in certain ways obviously you can do stuff but it's more like time constraints like how long can you spend on doing all these things in this box mm. and it's like that produces a different end result i think mm. Mm. um but you know the, the mpc live is so good yeah it's, it's been a bit of a game changer yeah recently and then uh how how much uh like how how often do you guys finish a tune? Like how does it look on average? Uh, um, how uh, try and meet once a week. Hmm. Yeah. Um, try and start something like you know it's nice to try and start something new and then go back to old, older older projects. I think, or if we don't really have anything we're particularly working on, it's usually just starting new stuff all the time. And then hmm. when you buzz off something, it just unfolds. Yeah. A lot um, of the time. Most of our re release tunes, I'd say, were done in like the idea was done in like a session or two max, and then and we then spent time on yeah. like the mix yeah. down and stuff. But like picking from the we always bounce stuff as demos, and then pick stuff from the demos and just work on those until we think because finished. I, I've I, in, in the past I've made tunes like over months and like just several thousand different versions and stuff and bounces and it's like it was really nice to be like well if it worked in the jam mm -hmm. then we've got something there yeah like you know 
if we were forcing it, it didn't feel right. So mm -hmm. if it flowed, then we were onto something kind of. Yeah, if it know. feels right, that usually ends up becoming a project that you end up opening the next session and yeah. adding to it, hearing stuff during the week that you think might work over it, hmm. bringing that to the studio. Again. Yeah, because you guys have had quite a few releases. I mean, uh, since uh, in 2014, yeah, I counted something like a dozen releases. So uh, yeah, we got really lucky. There was a, a couple of people of that just <laughs> trusted us to put EPs together. Yeah. Um, the James from Church in particular. Yeah gave us a really good platform uh, to put stuff out on. I think Bradley from Rhythm Section heard one of our, there was this bit at the beginning where we were just making stuff and just giving it to our mates, we just wanted. Well, we were testing it in Rywax on the system mm. as well. We'd, we'd, mm. we'd have a jam and then go to work and test it while like, mm. no yeah, it's was good in. just having a club sound system that you can put things so, on. So was it sort of uh, Rywax that also brought you this, uh, this little scene of friends? Well, everyone knew uh, where to find us kind yeah. of thing, you know. Yeah, it, is yeah. like, it was like, a, yeah. especially that time, it was quite yeah, a focal point. we to get as many people who were involved in music in any sense, really, in the local area. It was um, just a meeting point. To get involved and through that, just met so many people yeah. really quickly. And that was definitely great yeah, for us, especially at the time when we were just jamming all the time. Yeah. It's Callum and Dill as well, that's mm -hmm. from um, who, Dale Patel, who uh, has done all our videos for Rhythm Section, Callum Copley, um, they were in Rywax having a drink and heard it and asked for it on a USB and went to an after party. And then we got a text from Bradley mm -hmm. saying like, oh, I've heard your tune. And we, we hadn't sent anything or whatever. That's so cool. But it's yeah, just it's cool like... That's, to, that's like, really nice, together. organic. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's this Peckham, uh, South London area. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah, there's um, so many good people doing really cool shit. It's like like yeah. three other record shops opening within the same six months, venues opening. Uh, Peckham was really fun because it didn't necessarily have a nightclub in a sense. It had a lot of spaces where people were putting sound systems. Kind of smaller spaces. Smaller spaces, yeah. but not necessarily a club to go to, but there was this just one road, Rye Lane, and you'd know that every weekend there'd be something fun going on, it'd be some of your friends throwing a party. Um, Tom uh, from Wavy Tones was throwing loads of parties, some of the most exciting parties I'd been to in London. Mm. Mm. Made that um, Rashad and Spin one at Bussy, I think, is one of my favourite gigs I mean, ever. We, we kind of got into this topic in the car, but let's just revisit this uh, Bussy building. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole Rywax story, how, how, how that came about. Um, oh yeah, that was mostly through Tom and Mickey at Bussy Building. We'd kind of been hanging out as friends, going to the Wavy Tones parties. A lot of them were at Bussy Building or places in Peckham. Tom Unlikely. And this friends group, it almost become a joke. It was like, oh, we should open a record shop. I'd love to open a record shop. And then when Tom found out about a space in the basement of the Bussy Building that was going and they wanted to do something in it, he suggested a record shop to the owners and it sort of just snowballed from there where we got a bit of funding, we got the backing from the club. Mm -hmm. They helped us, you know, with everything to kind of set it up. Well, they still do, top. you know, yeah. they still put a lot of faith in that place. It causes them a lot of headaches. Yeah, I think it causes them a lot of headaches. I think but we they've caused always, them a lot of headaches. Um, Mickey and Sire, God bless them. Back to these <laughs> projects that maybe aren't even financially viable, but they've put themselves into it and we, yeah, we kind of worked together to make this space, which is like a balance between everyone who's kind of working in it. At yeah. The time. Can you can you give us like the 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 kind of synopsis of what Rye Wax is to you? A mm. space for people to go and listen to music. I think it was always like built on in inclusivity in the sense that we wanted anyone to feel like they could come down there and you know take their shoes off, have a drink. Their take their shoes off. Dance. They, they know, can take their shoes off. A lot of different people were kind of coming through and using it for different reasons. Yeah. The usual like club it, nights to zines. poetry zines. People would come in in the day and just like work on zines and um, like born and bred. Those girls would come in and then they brought the zine to sell. It was so cool. Mm -hmm. Like um, yeah, there's been loads of cool mm -hmm. stuff down there. Tom, who we were working with, was a, the big magnet. He was, you know, he was a big part of the nightlife already, and mm. he really got in these smaller crews that weren't really getting a big light shone on them. And 
giving them this space to use, uh, and it just worked. However they want as well, like. Yeah, however, however, however they wanted to use it, and then we had the record shop there, which we were buying a lot of records in for, uh, and that was a space where the, the kind of vinyl thing was popping off, and it was this perfect There's so place many to DJs come and there. buy a bunch of records, listen to some records, We'd have the you know kids come in and just listen to records. It was, nice. it was fun just having them come down and sit the headphones on. Yeah. Um, yeah, met so many people over such a short amount of time. So it's like kind of it's like food, cafe, record shop during the day, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, all the tables get put and into then the, the tables get shop. put aside, and then it's like a one hundred. You said one hundred cap. Yeah. One fifty. One twenty. Yeah. yeah. Don't really say cozy. fifty. We'll get in trouble. <laughs> one twenty. One twenty cap. Yeah. Uh, Strictly one twenty. Yeah. yeah. That includes guest lists as well. How, uh, how, how long do you go until? In the the license is the same as the CLF, uh, which is the, the club upstairs. Mm. Um, it's 6 a.m. But because of the size of the room, it rarely gets to 6 because it's one of those spaces where everyone's just like, let's just finish it like when it's mm -hmm. good, you know? At no the peak. One, no one ever tries to kind of over-egg it. Because mm. it feels like, you know, a lot of... You can see everyone's face in the room. There's no like, the bars at the back of the dance floor. The dance floor's there. It's just, it's just there. You said it's. You said it's. It feels like a nice living room. Well, yeah. Sometimes yeah. we leave the mm. rugs out, mm. just uh, depending on what kind of genre it, it may be. A few but sofas down there. Yeah. Very very low ceiling. If you're a bit too tall, you've got a. Uh, oh. Yeah. That's a vibe. Back pains. Oh, it's what's his yeah. name? There's, there's a few people who've played down there who, <laughs> you know, there, there's Beams. It's an old Victorian basement building. Mm. Got a really cool history to it, but if you're too tall, you have to rest between the beams. <laughs> Is it yeah. Prince William on Fade to Mind? <laughs> yeah, he's huge. Yeah, he came down and he you was DJing like that the whole time. It. Mm. <laughs> he's just like that. Yeah. And, um, um, so how, how has your time been divided between Rywax and FYI Chris like in the past couple of years? How has it looked for you guys? Well, like you said, we tried our day off usually used to be Mondays, mm -hmm. so we'd have a jam on a Monday and then we'd be working in the week, like when, when one wasn't working, the other one would be. So that was just kind of... One day you could get off. Yeah, yeah. One day a week. Yeah, I left a few years ago, five years ago, to start doing my own band camp, kind of posting sort of stuff. Yeah, um, that. I think it became a bit more easy to jam just because we didn't have the same timetable to share. Mm. Um, quite flexible schedules as well. Nice. Um, mm. What yeah. do you What do you do with Bandcamp? I was quite quite curious when you said that earlier. Well, uh, so I, I also I've worked for a bunch of labels over the past, and one that I've worked for a lot is First Word Records, it's mm. like a modern soul hip hop label. Big up Ali. Ali is hired me three or four different times over the last 10 years. So I've always uh, gone back to Ali, but uh, he had ended up starting, I was doing a lot of posting for him and we kind of worked out that we can post it for a bunch of other labels and make a little bit of money off it. And it subsidized the first word records label and that sort of grew and grew and I ended up just running that uh, on my own for a while. Um, nice. It's quite fun, just receive records, put them in envelopes, post them out. I've posted millions of records, I reckon. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I just posted a lot of fucking records. <laughs> and you're still, it's still a, still a nice vibe? Yeah, I'm doing it part-time again now. I went and did it full-time for a distributor for a bit, where I literally, uh, a nine till five, posted as many records as I possibly oh, wow. could. Uh, yeah. Um, then I got, I got married this year, that was exciting, but I quit, mm. I came in the day after I got married and quit the full-time job posting records. Mm. And went back to part-time just to mainly uh, do a bit more music yeah. and focus on something else, maybe retrain. So I don't have to post records for the rest of my life. Nice. Mm. And are, um, he's really, really good at I'm it. I'm quick. He's really good at posting so, records. So then maybe I'll connect that to uh, West Friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, is this a record label that you too uh, started? With Tom or? and Michael. Yeah, with, Tom. with Tom. It's kind of a little group venture. We wanted to have like a shop label, but we didn't want to call it Rio Wax Records. Mm -hmm. We just wanted something completely, just because we're, we're not very good at marketing, I think. <laughs> not we a wanted fight. everyone to be like, what the hell, who is this? What is this? Um, <laughs> if we'd have put Rio Wax Records on it, I think, um, actually it's been fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fine. 
But yeah, West Friends was supposed to be pretty West, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. It's a, you know, don't know. Yeah, it's just a good place to put our Friends music. There was yeah. a lot of being in a record shop, you're hearing all this yeah. uh, music around us. We were playing a lot of it out already. Mm. So it made sense to try and get a label together and yeah. release it. And we've had loads of help from Rubber Dub in Glasgow. And they've been really supportive of our music. Yeah. Um, and how, 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 do they, how do they support? Just by giving us a, a deal with distribution. And distribution deal. for us. Mm, and mm. um, and you know. believing in some of the records, like, as yeah, well. Yeah, some of them are a bit odd. And yeah, they yeah. were, you know, giving us really good feedback. So we've just gone ahead with it. Nice. Yeah. And um, fun seeing your friends' records in shops through the side of the yeah. that you've just put together. Yeah. 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 I mean, this it gives you guys like such a you guys have such a nice like healthy uh, release catalog with the rhythm section boys, um, you know, Church and the Benefi Pies and Toy Tonics, and you guys have West Friends. Mm -hmm. um, what is like sort of the future of releases? How is it uh, looking now? Next West Friends record. Next West Friends record out in February. That's a VA. That's, that's you guys? That's oh, a VA. VA. With a bunch of our friends under different yeah. odd aliases. Ned, Tom on that record. We've got um, a track. Track from Perco. Uh, big up Fergus. And uh, a mate from up north who was uh, in, uh, affiliated with the Gang Fatal Lots, uh, Simon, Simon Devine, Sierra. Uh, he's done some amazing um, atmospheric tracks and for the end sides. And then our mate, um, the soft Henry and uh, Xander, uh, really nice, like liquidy, mm. uh, liquid track, jungly so track. That's, that's next one on the label. Mm. We are working on an album, which is coming to together slowly. Getting a lot of support from a label called Blackacre. Mm. Big up Ian, he's been helping us loads recently, so it's become a bit of a different sort of approach to making music. There's some songs songs on the album, not okay. just like yeah, dance yeah. tracks. It's a lot more taking loads of influence from the people on the records, like Simeon, who we've done stuff with in the past. Great keys player, great singer. From does Colors stuff that with rise. the Colors That Rise. Pinty, who's also on rhythm section, we're really trying to work with at the moment. Um, and getting their kind of influences, slowing things down a little bit, speeding things up a little bit, and just kind of playing around with a lot of the stuff we DJ with, we've been given the Bal a Balami slot for the last few years, which has been great. We love doing the radio on Balami. And when we do that, we don't just play dance tracks all the time. Yeah, it's yeah. been fun to take those influences and try and put them into a longer record. Nice. Finding the samples again, like digging up all the weird little bits from YouTube. And at the moment, just trying to cram that all into something that might make sense. So yeah. so it seems like uh, it seems like the, the next like pretty exciting phase of your guys' um, career as uh, FYI, Chris. Yeah, it, f it feels great being approached by a label to do something and be given this kind of freedom with it. Um, Don't Black think we'd have done been super supportive. Don't think we ever intended on making an album. It was fun mm. just making the tracks and then yeah, yeah. you know we just make and make and make and when four sounded good together, that was the perfect time to either approach someone or when we were approached to say like, oh, we've got these four tracks that we've nearly finished. What do you think of them? We'll finish them for the EP if you want. But never thought beyond four tracks. And how long is it looking now? We've got like eight, ten. Well, could keep going. We've got like 20 demos or something <laughs> in, a, in a playlist. We're going to have to cut, cut them. It's going to be. Mm. But I mean, I think there is something formulating, there are like picks and maybe like yeah, for so something else. We're going to get a load of our own tunes together. We've got the playlist of like, yeah, almost like 15, 20 things in it. And eventually uh, it feels like we're going to just, like our DJ sets, just put piece it all together, all the bits that make sense. And then hopefully we can make some more EPs after that as well, because we'll yeah. have stuff left over. And yeah, yeah, I think we like, you, you know, we put it in the playlist because we like the sound of it. So mm. hopefully it'll find its way into a longer record and yeah. maybe some of the smaller ones. So when are you when are you hoping? What is the aspiration of when it would uh, come out roughly? Uh, you don't. Th yeah. There's no. There's <laughs> yeah. been. It's there's not, been no pressure. It's, to it's not it, gotten so. to that stage. Yeah. Uh, we, we, <laughs> spring. We want to try and finish mm -hmm. the mm. thing 
uh, you know, spring, but you know, that's like summer coming 2020 yeah. <laughs> soon <laughs> who knows yes yeah, soon um maybe nice. 2021 that's really yeah. exciting yeah i'm very recently, curious to hear yeah, that been i'm very curious to hear <laughs> that um we'll show you some tracks later mm. yeah please do please do and um yeah i mean i kind of wanted to touch a little bit um in connection with that on touring and sort of how that's been for you guys um are you hoping to ramp ramp up the touring now that sort of more music is coming out yeah yeah i do I think need nice. gigs <laughs> hey <laughs> london's hit up hit up london's the guys london's hit up the guys spending. for gigs um <laughs> we are available for parties <laughs> for your function um yeah i'd love to so uh, it's like a big motivation for uh love making music and stuff but the idea of making it and then someone somewhere else getting you over to come and play that music and, and other people's music in this club is an even bigger motivation. Hmm. Um, it's, it's like one of my favourite things to do ever, like DJ. Like, um, yeah, I could put this like, it's like the only hobby that like, it's like, oh, he's going to grow out of that two months or whatever. And hmm. it's never happened. It's just hmm. like, just got more and more into it. Yeah. So like, if people book me, I will go and play. Mm. <laughs> it, like, yeah, I've done some weird gigs because I love DJing, mm. and, and I hope to continue to do so. So I mean, you're you're basically going more into just being the full time musicians, or what is what is or what is your your idea? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's really difficult to be a full time musician. Yeah. Uh, always got work on the back of your mind. Um, I, I don't think that gets in the way of making music in any way. Mm, mm. Sometimes I think we've both found that you know the more you work, those moments you do get in the studio it's become more intense. More, yeah, intense maybe is yeah. the right word. Or mm. you just it just you land on your feet a lot quicker sometimes if you're given all the time in the world. I think you tend to, to piss around. Yeah, you just piss yeah. around more, and it doesn't become Fair as enough. focused. And you know, the, we've said before. I think the ideal studio time is three hours. Mm. You go in, and then after that three hours, it starts to become a little bit hazier, and you slow down a little bit. And Maybe that's because something else, yeah. though. But um, <laughs> there is that like three hours fatigue. of power. Yeah, it's fatigue. The power it's just hours. the fatigue. Just yeah, fatigue. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can have a break and go back to it. But if you keep that in mind, that gives you enough time to work in the mm. daytime, mm. so you can pay your rent and then mm. still get music f f fitted in. Yeah, I think that sounds like a good life balance. Yeah. Hmm. I don't think I could do music full, full time. I'd have to do hmm. something else. Hmm. Cool. Just I to get out of the studio. Yeah? I reckon. I'm and not sure how. Do you, do you guys, yeah. what, what other um, kind of dreams do you have with music? Have you thought of like working with any like vocalists, like being producer, producers like that? Or, um, That's something like Or like moving picture stuff? Or this is the kind of stuff I like to ask people. Well, like doing this album is definitely I, I think I would like us to do more stuff for maybe not us, you know. Yeah. Like that and working is, with people's been really fun. Yeah. That's the most exciting thing again, you know, working as a duo, but I think yeah, when we get people like Sim, Pinty, Ned in the studio, we're we're so used to working together and trying to not stay you know, you got, when you're working with someone you can't just sit and be bored. You know, mm. you've got to keep things moving so it's fun yeah. getting someone else in the studio working out what they're about and like playing off that and keeping it going. Mm. Nice. I'd love to record, you know, not just dance music as well. We've both got such huge influence outside. We've mm. both recorded stuff, yeah, even recently, like we do a few post-punky things, stuff that we'll probably never see the day of light, but it'll be like, oh, got this hip hop beat I started. Do you want to just fuck around with it for the last 20 minutes of a session? And getting those into the hands of people who can sing and do stuff would be really fun in the future. Mm. Mm. Also, like, we, you were saying about the video clips and stuff, like, we, like, you've got a drone now, and, like, yeah, some of the footage, footage, like, the last video we did is, like, mostly on that drone, mm -hmm. but, like, making weird shit, or all, all the stuff that, like, the offshoots that come out of the, like, oh, let's bounce that as a separate little weird mm -hmm. thing, like, definitely putting that towards, like, more oddball, visuals mm. is something that 
a YouTube channel. That's like an aspiration I think we both would have. Is like if we could have a, a YouTube channel that was anywhere near as popular as our music. And, so, and, 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 and what music is like and, music videos and for film, tracks? And start filming our own stuff or compiling our own stuff would be just as fun as Try music. A, like a Houseum or uh, this kind of stuff where they just they make videos for other people's tracks? Or uh, no, no, oh, no, or no, just like just weird just you, shit just weird, stuff we just your own. Just own creations. Little, we yeah. just love making little bits and bobs. No, we're not trying to make like a Vivo or something. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, so, no, it's, no. so it's your visual art. It's going yeah. 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 to cool be hard to watch. To get into. We should do that. Um, yeah, that would be more exciting than anything else. Mm. <laughs> yeah, mm. I, I think like one thing this decade has uh, told me is just like the kids are right. Just be a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's where it's at. <laughs> Definitely. So, um, Everyone's addicted to it, so... Uh, it's better than telly. Yeah. Of course it is. It's better than telly, it's better than records. Better than <laughs> no, I mean, really, uh, videos <laughs> are, are, are the gateway to music these days, yep. so many times. Yeah, yeah. People or the gateway rather... to seeing a man consume some army rations from the Boer Wars. That's also, it's possible. Yeah. I mean... You don't know what you find on the internet. <sighs> that's the best thing about it. It's yeah. beautiful, man. <laughs> Nice. Let's fucking have it. I think uh, I think I'm I'm I'm, I'm quite I'm quite happy with this. Okay. Hey. Perfect. Yeah. Nice one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice ah. one. Good interview. Thanks. Thanks.